there's been a great deal of speculation about whether, what, when the Fed would cut rates. Some say that uh, it's going to be a lot of rate cutting this year. Some say none. Uh, what say you? I, I say that really it will depend on the path of the economy. Our, our focus is on maximum employment and price stability, and those, and the incoming data as they affect the the, uh, the outlook, and those are the things we'll be looking at. Don't blame me, Charlie. I can't see. All right. Today is Sunday, the 24th of March. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. But folks, I got a good one for you tonight. We begin with an update to the medical mystery that I had last week. After extensive round of testing and visitation to medical experts, they concluded that I just took one of those lemons from the Wolf of Wall Street. After 15 years in storage, the lemons had developed a delayed fuse. It took 90 minutes for these little fuckers to kick in, but once they did, pow. Now, all kidding aside, among the symptoms, if you're taking notes, now I'm getting these electricity shots from my left knee. So go figure, but uh, what is it with these medical experts? They tell us one thing and we follow it, and then a uh, few months later, a few years later, oh, that was actually bad for you. Whoops, we made a mistake. For example, this week, uh, we got the news that medical experts now found out that intermittent fasting actually puts your heart health at risk. So all of that fasting, thinking that you're gonna get healthier, might as well just hit that bucket of KFC. And for all you know, all of this talk about fast food being bad for you, next thing you know, these medical experts will come out and say, oh, it turns out that fast food is actually healthy for you. Maybe the fast food industry is not paying these medical experts the rent, even though they found out some interesting uh, side effect to eating a lot of fast food. The headline reads, the average uh, length has grown in 30 years. Doctors call it concerning. Oh, they must be just jealous of those gains. They're growing and it's showing. The average uh, has increased over the past 30 years. A new study has revealed, but experts warn it might not be the ideal reality every man's dreamed of. As it turns out, size does matter. Researchers fear that phallic inflation is due to unhealthy habits like binging junk food or being sedentary or even pollution. So gents, find the most polluted environment in the US and sit in your ass and keep eating that cheeseburger. Forget about the intermittent fasting and all of that bullshit. And ladies, if you have your man's birthday coming out soon, take your man out to Fat Burger to get him some of that inflation. Even though it's gonna cost you a lot, because now we have food inflation coming back up. It's not just food inflation, it's pretty much everything. The signs are here, the warnings are here, the trends are showing up, but somehow, the delusional madman at the helm of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, is insisting that, uh... Mission accomplished, inflation has been defeated, uh, he has to cut rates now. Is it really mission accomplished or is it surrendering to inflation? And why is the man surrendering right now? That's what we're going to try to investigate in this show. And without further ado, here it is, in Focus Tonight. Zombie. No conscious, no understanding, even when the signs are right in front of you, even when the mistakes from the past, well studied, he insists on doing the same mistake again. The only explanation is this man is a zombie, stripped away from any critical thinking at all, just the walking dead. You know what's really interesting about this week in the stock market? It's going to be a shortened trading week. So we're going to wrap it up Thursday. We have no trading on Friday. And the rationale goes, okay, we have a shortened trading week, uh, holiday week. So the path of least resistance to the upside, the volume will be down. So expectations are it's going to be a really good week for the stock market. The problem is on Friday, we have a bunch of data release. Among the data that will be released is the PCE inflation rate, the Fed's favorite gauge. 
Of course, Zombie Pal will be speaking on Friday, as if it's done by design. They give us the false sense of security and then they bag us on Friday. Because when you look at the recent inflation trends, the moment the Federal Reserve, led by Zombie Pal, signaled that not only they're pausing, but uh, soon enough they're going to be cutting rates because mission accomplished, it's over. The economy lives and inflation is gone, it's dead, let's cut rates already. The moment that signal was absorbed in the economy, that was the moment when we're seeing inflation making a comeback. Okay, you're gonna release the pressure off me. I'm coming back. So is it really mission accomplished, folks, or is it surrendering to inflation? Or was it this week, despite all of the data, when the Fed chairman came out and insisted that he's gonna cut rates three times, was it the day that the Federal Reserve finally surrender to inflation? Because when you look at the trends, the year-on-year -year readings, those are the standard. But then we have to look at the three-month annualized rate, the six-month, the one month, those short-term trends, they give us the leading indicators whether inflation is coming back or not. And when you look at the trend, the three-month analyzed, or the six, you can see the trend for yourself. It appears that it was sort of mission accomplished in December, but the moment he opened his mouth and declared mission accomplished, inflation came back and said, watch this, you back off, I come back in. That's the nature of the fight against inflation. You cannot give up. You have to finish the course. Otherwise, cancer will come back into the economy. Cancer will come back into the market. What do you see in the market right now, all of these bubbles? That's cancer coming back. That's the symptom that inflation is coming back. And now we're beginning to see it in the official data. But the question now becomes, did the Fed just declare that their inflation target has moved up from 2%, let's say to 25 or 3%, even if it is unofficial? Is this what the Fed is signaling? A surrender against the 2% inflation target? Because there is no possible way. After the data that we got from the CPI, the PPI, many more, some we're going to discuss right here in this program, there's absolutely no way, after seeing all of that data, that you will insist on three rate cuts and still quasi declare that mission accomplished unless you move the inflation target from 2% to 2% plus. And this is why we have worries about the official commitment to 2%. Maybe that's not achievable. And the Fed is listening to certain folks that you people listen to in the media all the time. We're now convincing the Fed chairman that he needs to up the inflation target. The chief investment officer of Opal Capital, Austin Graff. He says it's like the Fed was data dependent until the data no longer supported its story. So if you go back to the meeting from December, Jerome Powell came out and said, if you look at the three month annualized rate, the six month annualized rate, all of them are moving below 2%. And this is why he felt comfortable looking at the data being data dependent that cuts are coming and they become appropriate. But now the data has changed in two months. The three month, six month annualized rate moving back up. So why are we keeping the same stance from December if we are indeed data dependent, Mr. Powell? What's really alarming folks, forget about the CPI, PPI. We all know that these estimates are coming back up. And by the way, uh, the CPI rate in reality, the inflation rate in reality in this economy is probably still north of 7%. We'll talk about this in a minute, but look at the data that we got this week. Some of the data is absolutely alarming. I'm now producing on my Discord a macro brief each morning when we get macro data. I give you the data and then give you my commentary. So here's the good news for the Fed. Came from one piece of data. That's the Philly Manufacturing Index. The headline reading dropped by two points. It is still the second positive reading in a row. So 3.2. Last month it was 5.2. It's been negative for a long time, but now we see a recovery in manufacturing. Be careful though, because that's going to be problematic in the next piece of data. For now, the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index shows that prices drop the positive 3.7 in March, so that means the price is still going higher. But the last reading was 16.6, so we see a big drop here in prices paid, while we see the headline reading still being positive, holding. So that's a good news for the Fed. That's good news that the policy right now of holding is probably appropriate. Here's the problem, though. We got the flash PMI. For you traders, you watched what happened to the dollar index when that piece of data came out. So initially on Wednesday, when Jerome Powell came out in the FOMC and said, yeah, we're going to cut rates three times, everything is okay, uh, hunky-dory, we live a happily ever after. By the way, the man right now is, rumor has it, he's writing a book 
on mission accomplished. The man who defeated inflation without a recession. He's already declaring victory, folks. He's already popping the champagne. And the reason is the man is an egomaniac. But the moment this piece of data came out, we have seen one of the most stunning reversals in the US dollar. Indicative that Powell was wrong. And the data is going to poke his eyes out in the next few months. When we look at the flash PMI, services PMI for March decreased by 0.6 points from 52.3 to 51.7 month on month. So we have contraction in services activities. While manufacturing PMI for March increased from 52.2 to 52 and a half month on month. So we see increasing in activities in manufacturing. And there is an important point to make, but input cost rose at the fastest pace in six months and selling prices rose at the fastest pace since April, 2023. Output expansion in services sector was the weakest in three months, while the output expansion in manufacturing was the fastest since 2022. Output price inflation in manufacturing is at 13-month high, while output price inflation from services is at 8-month high. And here's my commentary. This is a piece of data that suggests that the Fed is on the wrong track, and it will risk a sharp rise in inflation in incoming months. While we see the services sector activity is cool, manufacturing is beginning to heat up again, which suggests that goods inflation will rebound. We've been predicting in this channel for a while now that goods inflation will rebound. And once that happens, combined with sticky services inflation, the readings will get ugly again. Anyhow, the slowdown in the service sector was mostly attributed to higher wages and fuel costs which suggests that services is in stagflation mode. From an investor's point of view, we should begin rotating portfolios away from services toward manufacturing of goods as they begin exercising their pricing power again. We got a few corporate earnings this week that illustrates that a lot of companies are now exercising the pricing power once again, which is inflationary. Now, why do we see this phenomenon of oh, services beginning to cool off even though inflation is not coming down, just activities? slowing down because the input cost for the service sector went higher because of wages and fuel cost. While we see manufacturing, which was dead for a long time, coming back, but it's coming back with steep inflation. This is happening due to the icy hot phenomenon that we've been talking about since last year. When the Fed does these tame and shy interest rate hikes, tick by tick, little by little, instead of shocking and awing the economy, pushing us into a mild recession to remove the inflationary psychology added the system. Instead of doing that, they went with the slow drip, 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 little by little by little, tick by tick by tick. And what that does is unequal pressure on the economy because our economy is unequal. We are mostly a services-based economy, not a manufacturing one. The amount of pressure needed to remove inflation out of the services sector is certainly higher than the amount of pressure needed to remove inflation from the manufacturing sector. So this Fed hiking campaign so far, all it did is slow down the rate of inflation in services, but keep it at sticky. And of course, crush the inflation rate in manufacturing, aka goods. Now, as the Fed says, okay, mission accomplished, we're going to remove the pressure by cutting rates. What happens? Well, services inflation is still high, still sticky. It will begin to accelerate as we see the reflection of these wage hikes beginning to show up. But what's going to recover right away is goods inflation. And the reason is the pressure is no longer here by the Fed, even though rates remaining the same. But signaling is really important. That's what the man does not understand. He signaled to the goods part of the economy that the pressure is over. Now we might resume activities and raise prices again. So we're going to see, folks, in the next pieces of data, goods inflation coming back in the picture. And listen to some of the commentary that we got in this uh, Flash PMI report. And you tell me, if you're data dependent, would you really insist on cutting rates right now with this piece of data? Here it is. Inflationary pressures picked up in March. The rate of input cost inflation quickened to a six-month high amid faster increases across both monitored sectors. Service providers indicated that higher operating expenses generally reflected increasing wages, while rising oil and gasoline costs were often monitored by manufacturers. In turn, listen to this, companies in the U.S. raised their own selling prices at the faster pace. In fact, the rate of inflation was 
as the sharpest in just under a year and stronger than the serious average. Respective rates of output price inflation accelerated sharply across both manufacturing and services, quickening to 13 and 8 month high as companies pass through higher input costs to their customers. So again, rating this, what are you getting folks? Are you getting that mission accomplished that inflation is gone and we're gonna cut rates and land in the soft landing and everybody lives happily ever after? I don't think so. It doesn't say doesn't indicate that that would be the case. If anything, it indicates that we're probably heading to the same mistake from 2008 and the 1970s. I mean, ironically, Jerome Powell's worst fear is the comparison of him and uh, former Fed chairman Arthur Burns, who's under his watch. We've seen inflation resurging in the 70s. But again, the irony is both men have the same stupid haircut and the same glasses. I think they're going to end up following the same path. Here's the commentary from Chris Williamson from the S&P Global responsible for the flash PMI. Listen to this. A steepening rise in costs combined with strengthened pricing power amid the recent upturn in demand meant inflationary pressures gathered pace again in March. Costs have increased on the back of further wage growth. This is really important because in the meeting in the FOMC conference, Jerome Powell indicated that the higher wages not leading to higher inflation. Baloney. The data says it is. Anyhow, costs have increased on the back of further wage growth and rising fuel prices, pushing overall selling price inflation for goods and services up to the highest for nearly a year. The steep jump in prices from the recent low seen in January, hence add unwelcome upward pressure on consumer prices in the coming months. Dear Americans, ladies and gentlemen, prepare for inflation to come back. The second wave, we've been talking about it for a while now. The pause was a warning sign. Now he signals cutting and he might actually needs to cut at some point because of an accident. And that's going to unleash the second wave. And that's going to be disastrous for the consumer. Again, look at what's responsible for the drop in inflation. Is it really core services in the pink line? Okay, that went down a little bit. You'll see pressure, downward pressure when you increase rates but the kind of pressure needed to drop the services sector down to two percent requires way more aggression than what the fed has shown so far the good news is what the fed has done so far was good enough to crash core goods inflation it went down below two percent the fed's target but now based on the data we just received this week it appears that goods inflation is coming back. And with sticky services, you put two and two together, the headline CPI, PPI inflation rates will begin to move higher. The question is, what is the threshold for the Fed before they begin saying, okay, no cuts? And what is the threshold for the Fed to say, okay, we're going with rate hikes? Powell never really answered any of that. But again, look at the headline CPI, the 12 month, that's the year on year, 3.2%. But the problem is if you look at the shorter term trends, the three month, that's 4%. The one month, 5.4%. If you look at core goods, it was negative for a while. Now the one month rate is moving back positive. That's going to be a problem in the next inflation rating. So if you're looking at the crystal ball, what could upset the economy and the market right now? If you recall the video that I made about the most dangerous bubble in history, go back to Black Friday when the Nasdaq crashed by 10% in a single day. What was the reason? It wasn't because, oh, Cisco popped or Qualcomm dropped or Microsoft did this. No, no, no. It was just higher inflation data. And the market decided that, okay, now the Fed will have to be more aggressive. And that was the moment when we realized that the bubble already popped. We go back to the morning brief. We also got leading economic indicators. Now, they've been negative for a long time. But this reading that we got was the first positive reading since February 22. Good news, right? Here's the problem. However, the index rose in the back of rising stock prices, higher working hours in manufacturing, and lending credit index, which also includes the Fed's lending to banks. My commentary. This suggests that the economy is improving on the backs of the asset bubble in the stock market. Higher inflation pressures in manufacturing manufacturing and more liquidity by the Federal Reserve to the banking sector. This suggests weak expansion of the economy that does not include healthy and robust consumer conditions. It also solidifies higher inflation in goods prices to come, and higher working hours in manufacturing means higher wages, which will be passed to the end consumer. So here you look at the leading economic indicators, you see that we're curling, maybe we're bottomed here, we're moving up, and folks will look at that as a positive. Maybe the leading indicators for a recession, those are disappearing, but then you look at the data, you look at the details, look at what went positive. Average weekly hours of manufacturing, you have the stock market, the S&P 500, and then you got the leading credit index. Now that we have easing of financial conditions, thank you to the Fed. 
So again, when we look at the details, not good news for the economy. Then we also got existing home sales, 4.38 million. The estimate was 3.95 million. The month on month growth, 9.5%. The estimate minus 1.3 huge beat here in existing home sales the median home price up 5.7 percent year on year now if you read the headline by cnbc it says february home sales spike nine and a half percent the largest monthly gain in a year as supply improves i disagree with diana here that the reason is supply improves because Look at what she wrote. Existing home sales up 9.5%. That's month on month. But then she's looking at year on year numbers and in inventories, 5.9%. So that doesn't really explain it. While well, we got sequential growth in existing home sales. Then if you look at the third point she made, higher demand continued to push the medium price higher, up 5.7%. Bingo. There it is, Diana. We go back to my commentary. Maybe I should be working for CNBC instead. The data suggests capitulation by potential home buyers who are tired of waiting for better pricing. This is inflationary because it encourages home sellers to exercise pricing power and raise pricing as demand begins to show up regardless of higher interest rates. It also suggests that activities in the real estate market, specifically housing, let's say, not commercial real estate, is and will heat up as consumers begin to think. Today's price is bad, but it's better than tomorrow's price. Inflationary psychology, which will be good for real estate listing stocks such as Zillow, rental home companies like Innovation Homes, because higher home prices increases the leverage that rental companies have over tenants price-wise. And you saw Zillow shooting up higher after we got this data. You've seen the uh, home builders, Lennar, D.R. Horton, all shooting up higher. Of course, there is a validation point coming out this Monday, so tomorrow, with new home sales. I think that piece of data will be more important to Lennar, D.R. Horton, Toll Brothers. But the data about existing home sales, it says that consumers, potential home buyers, they got the savings. They've only been waiting for better rates and better pricing. Well, they've been waiting, 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 not happening. At some point, you're going to capitulate and just buy. Once you do that and you buy the home, the other buyers will look around and say, whoops, we were watching this home. Now it's sold. We better buy the home that we're eyeing before somebody else buys it. And from the seller's side, if you're selling at a home that you want to sell, but you haven't found good demand, when you see that buyers are beginning to capitulate, what is that going to do? It encourages you to sell the house. And maybe at a better price than the listing price. So we see activities coming back. All of this is inflationary, folks. So you have pressure, upward pressure coming from every corner now. Not just from the service sector alone, but even dormant sectors in the last, let's say, two years, such as housing, such as manufacturing. Upward price pressure is coming back in with all of this data. All of this evidence, here's what Jerome Powell is actually thinking about. He wants to slow down the shrinking of the $7.5 trillion balance sheet fairly soon. He wants to cut rates, regardless of the data that we just discussed. So again, I want you to tell me, what, what is the reasoning? What do you think his reasoning behind this kind of thinking? Besides being a zombie, incapable of thinking. You see gasoline prices moving higher again, three and a half bucks a gallon. Now that's the average, including the South, but you look at the West in California and Nevada and Oregon, East Coast, those prices are well above four, four and a half bucks per gallon. And those prices will continue to increase because now we have interest rate cut expectations that's leading speculation in commodities, leading the gasoline Arba price higher number one number two the shortage in refineries that's causing gasoline prices to go higher not to mention of course the war in ukraine and what's going on with russia right now that's beginning to heat up again we got the news about the attack on friday against uh, russia of course now the russians are blaming involvement by ukraine and we got the news that russia is now preparing a hundred thousand soldiers for a possible summer offensive as the war reignites and heats up again, we will see oil prices going higher, and that will add to the pressure, the inflationary pressure that we got in the economy, and revive goods inflation, revive services inflation, everything inflation. And now we're seeing it in food prices. They're beginning to pick up too. We got a study from Germany that climate change effects are causing higher food prices. I look no further than cocoa prices. They're surging significantly higher because of a shortage of supply. The harvest is not really good. And now you're about to see the reflection of these higher prices on the items that you buy. Companies behind Hershey's and Cadbury Chocolate signaled possible price hikes amid cocoa cost surge. That's inevitable. That's going to happen. The only thing keeping, let's say, grains prices, if you look at grains commodities, these are down. The only thing keeping those down is the weaker demand from China. But now we're getting some pieces of data, which we're going to discuss in a minute here, that demand is maybe coming back from China. And that's going to amplify the inflation problem 
On the other hand, we have a weakening consumer here, domestically, and that's going to exacerbate the problem of stagflation. You look at eggs prices, maybe they bottomed right now, and they're moving higher ahead of Easter. And the shocking news that we got, folks, over the weekend is a study by Harvard, led by Larry Summers, and he says in his findings that inflation reached 18% in 22, if we used the previous formula from the 1970s and 1980s. So right now, if you consider the drop in inflation so far, if we use the same formula, the inflation rate officially 3.2%. But in reality, it is north of 7%. Maybe that explains why the consumer out there is not happy. You see, the administration is baffled. They look at the official statistics, inflation going down, but the polls are not reflecting that. Consumers and voters are angry. And they're baffled about the reason. Well, maybe the reason is, in reality, the inflation rate is way higher than the official statistics. And now we have an official study from Harvard, not from the Maverick for Wall Street, not from some YouTuber, from Harvard, indicating that we were right all along. The inflation rate is way too high, higher, by the way, in 22, higher than the 80s and the 70s, as you see the chart indicating. So the question now becomes, the Fed is looking for the neutral rate, and maybe this is why they're trying to cut rates. They think that their policy right now is restrictive because of what they see in the banking sector, for example, or some consumer data. And Jerome Powell wants his cake and eat it too. A reduced inflation without causing a recession. Pursuing a fantasy. If he's wrong, we're all fucked. And the problem with the neutral rate is it fluctuates based on the data, based on the time. You cannot really base policy based on the neutral rate. Times are different. The Fed says the neutral rate is 2.5%. Well, if you want to cut rates to 2.5%, maybe that's why Jerome Powell is just insisting on cutting rates regardless to go down to the neutral rate. Well, Mr. Powell, times have changed and the neutral rate could be way higher than 2.5%. Here's Larry Summers explaining all of that. They need to take a view because if you don't know what's neutral, you don't know how expansionary or restrictive uh, you're being. And I find their view that the ultimate neutral rate is 2.6 to be bizarre in uh, current circumstances. Here's what we have relative to a few years ago when they said it was 2.5. We've got fiscal policy in a much, much more expansionary place with much higher deficits, much larger role of debt. That puts pressure on credit markets. We've got a huge set of new private sector investments going on with respect to green investment in the IRA, going on with respect to resilience and uh, reducing dependence on single uh, sources. We've got a potential huge source of demand for chips and for electricity coming out of the AI revolution. And we've got a huge wealth effect as markets in for both housing and stocks have run way up for the last few years. So with all of those impulses to demand, I cannot understand why someone would form the view that the neutral rate was essentially the same as they, as they thought it was uh, four years ago. And I think the neutral rate is far more likely to have a four handle on it right now than it is to have a two handle. And forget about the neutral rate. The question now becomes, is the rate that the Fed has achieved so far restrictive enough? A lot of folks say, yeah, it is restrictive. Look at banks, look at consumers. All I have to do is look at the stock market, look at Bitcoin. If rates were restrictive right now, you think we would have seen a bubble forming in the market or in cryptos? Here's Larry Summers again. From that perspective, I'm not at all sure how restrictive monetary policy really is. And the proof's really in the pudding. Monetary policies by now had a very long time for the lags to work through. The transmission variables, stock prices, interest rates, long-term interest rates, credit spreads are flashing green and uh, loose. The proof is in the pudding. Look at what's going on in the market. You know that rates 
are not restrictive, meaning that the Fed needs to raise rates again. To avoid that, they have to give the market and the economy the illusion that they're hawkish. They cannot even talk about interest rate cuts. They cannot give the permission for inflation to come back higher again. But unfortunately, the Fed capitulated, the Fed surrendered, and gave that signal already. Even without cutting rates at this point, they gave the signal to inflation to come back. And now the risk is, what if the next move could actually be a rate hike? Not because the Fed wants to, but the Fed will be forced to do it. And even without the hike, the market will begin doing the hikes for the Fed, whether they like it or not, looking at the bond market yields. Here's the headline, the Fed risks having to tie in policy again because its overly dovish stance loosened financial conditions, top economists say. What is he talking about? Here it is, the Federal Reserve's dovish tone since the end of last year has fueled the market rally and loosened financial conditions, complicating its mission and potentially setting the stage for further tightening, according to Kamal Shri Kumar. He adds that he doesn't see no reason for the dovishness that the Fed has been broadcasting to markets, and that he worries about the potential for a policy reversal, adding it have been better to be more cautious on the forecast in terms of expectations so that you don't have to reverse, and that is the risk. And I say amen. Adding that the Fed supercharged rate cut expectations, but easing financial conditions could do more inflationary pressures and cause a pivot back to more hawkish stance. This is the most important part from his commentary. Shri Kumar warned that if the central bank keeps rates higher for longer, a quote, hard landing, end quote, scenario could drag down multiple industries, including banking and real estate. If you have the Fed not cutting interest rates, not only today, but also May or June, then there is pressure to push the 10-year yield up, he said, pointing to mid-sized and small banks that bought 10-year treasuries at a low rate, which would be more underwater than they are today if rates stay high. What are we gathering from all of this? The policy as it is right now, restrictive to some sectors, banking, real estate, consumers, at least some consumers, but the policy is loose overall to other sectors in the economy. Hence, we have the icy hot phenomenon. And this is disastrous for the economy because at some point, as inflation comes back, you'll have to add pressure again. And what's already been damaged will be damaged even more. Think regional banks, Think commercial real estate, think uh, the low-end consumer. And what we see right now, when we look at this, average hourly earnings going higher, but interest payment is surging higher because rates are too high for a lot of consumers right now, as it is. Not high enough to kill inflation. And of course, playing the psychology is the most important part in fighting against inflation. That's what Jerome Powell is really bad at, playing psychology. While interest payments for consumers surging higher, Net interest income is actually collapsing, so consumers are not getting any benefit from higher rates. It's only an added burden because their savings accounts are not really paying anything. Most consumers don't know about money market funds, so they're accepting these lower rates and they're losing to inflation. That's a sad tragedy. Even one of the most notorious pumpers of the economy, Bank of America Brian Monahan, he says and warns Jerome Powell, be mindful on relying on consumers to prop up the economy because they're beginning to burn out. Again, stagflation, some inflation, some contraction. The combination of the worst of both worlds. And now we go to the main dilemma. What will happen first? Will it be the Federal Reserve hiking rates? Because if they do that, if they hike rates, the market will crash, the economy will slump into a recession. Or will they, as they broadcasted, will cut rates? And the ramification of that, looking at the inflation data that we got, is a resurgence in inflation, specifically oil and other commodities. For now, we are in the hold territory. And as I said before repeatedly, the Fed is not in charge, inflation is. So the Fed will be forced to one of these decisions, hike or a cut. The question now becomes, I'd love to hear your commentary on the comment section. Which one do you think will happen first? When it comes to the hike, I think we will force the Federal Reserve to hike rates if headline PCE climbs over 3%. And I don't think the 3% will scare the Fed. I think 35 will be more like it. Now that's going to take time before we see PCE moving higher above 3, 3.5%. So for now, we look at the data, it is showing an alarming sign, worrisome leading indicators about the inflation rate, but it's not showing up in the data yet, at least the data that matters to the Fed. So for now, the odds for a hike are off the table. The odds for a cut, well, why would that happen? Because right now the Fed has no incentive to cut rates. Everything is working fine. Why would you cut rates? Again, they have to be forced into doing that. I think that will happen one of both ways. Either unemployment heading toward 4.5% 
or we see another banking crisis. Right now, the odds say that the Fed will probably do the mistake of cutting because they'll be forced to cut. But what that's going to do is bring inflation back up because they'll do the cuts to remedy one sector of the economy, banking, high unemployment in a certain sector that takes the rate above four, four and a half percent. But as they do that and they cut rates, inflation comes back up and then they have to hike again. And at that point, game over. Stock market crashes, bubbles pop, the economy goes into a deep recession. But folks, I don't like to speculate a lot. I like to look at corporate data, what the corporations are doing, because they're going to decide. If they're heading toward laying off employees to cut costs, then that solidifies that the next move by the Fed will be being forced into a rate cut. If the companies, on the other hand, are raising prices, then I think the odds are for the Fed being forced to hike. This week, and we covered this in details for the members, we talked about General Mills earnings. And the headline reads, Cheerios maker General Mills tops quarterly estimates on higher product prices. So the volume was down, volume of sales was down, meaning consumers are buying less. But the company is charging more for these goods. But even with doing that, we looked at the data. Net sales were minus 1% year on year. So even with raising prices, so you'll hear a lot in the media these days, that all inflation is just sticking because of corporate greed or price gouging. The problem is even with the price gouging that they're doing, their sales are still negative. So they have no other option but to continue to raise prices higher and higher and higher. Now, what was rewarding by the market, the stock, you saw the stock of GIS moving higher. Why did that happen? Because the net income, the profit of the company increased dramatically year on year. Well, gee, we just talked about sales being minus 1% despite the price hikes. What caused the margins to improve? Cutting costs. And the easiest way you can do that is laying off employees. And the stock market is now rewarding companies for cutting costs. Because we know that increase in revenue is becoming really limited as the consumer continues to get weaker and weaker and weaker with higher rates and higher inflation. This week, we got FedEx, and here's the headline from FedEx Earnings. FedEx stock surges as earnings get a boost from cost-cutting efforts. And oh, by the way, they're also doing a 5 billion share buybacks program. So they get rid of the employees, they cut costs, and then they use the money for share buybacks. But look at the details, folks. What we're trying to figure here what will it be? Rate hike or rate cut? Rate hike if companies are heading toward increasing prices. Rate cut if companies are heading toward more cost cutting. Let's look at the numbers and let the numbers decide. You look at the total revenue for FedEx, down 2%. So the rate of business activities actually slowed down year on year. They're losing in revenue year on year. Now, can they raise prices to remedy that? There's a lot of risk of doing that as you see the consumer getting weaker. But then you look at the expenses for the company, down 3% year on year. And that's good, even though your revenue is down 2%, but your expenses are down 3% year on year, so the margins should be good. And we look at the net income, it's actually positive about 14%. And this is why the stack went higher. Here's the catch, though. The major contributor to the drop in expenses was fuel cost. That was down 16% year on year. But now we see that gasoline prices, diesel prices are going back up. Jet fuel prices going back up. So this catalyst will be removed in the next quarterly reading by FedEx. Question now becomes, if you're a CEO of the company, how do you balance your margins and keep them positive? Do you increase the pricing? Do you see that the consumer is willing to spend more now? You see business activities picking up and you raise pricing. Then sure, fuel costs will go higher. Your expenses will rebound and go higher, but that will be offset by the increase in revenues. Or you think that the environment is still weak and you cannot risk increasing pricing. So what you do is lowering your expenses. And the easiest way you can do that, because you cannot control fuel, salaries and employee benefits, down 2%. You can cut that more, quarter on quarter, year on year, which one is the easiest avenue? I would say it's easier for the company to cut salaries and employee benefits, aka firing some employees. Then we got Nike. Headline reads, Nike shares slide on lackluster outlook, slowing China sales. I disagree with this headline a little bit, but let's look at the data once again. Revenues, the growth is 0%, nothing. Year on year, flattish. The cost of sales down 2%. Okay, that's not a big problem because your revenue is growing by nothing, but the cost of sales down 2%. Here's the problem. Expenses, which include salaries and employees, up 7% year on year. So you have the rate of growth in expenses exceeding the rate of growth in revenues. 
Well, the end effect is net income, the bottom line, down 5% year on year. What do you think Nike will do? Increase pricing to fix these margins, the net income, or is it easier for Nike to cut expenses? I think the answer is clear. And by the way, when we go look at China, oh, China's weak. No, no, no. Sales in greater China were actually positive year on year. It was actually the strongest segment in Nike's earnings. The weakest was Europe and the Middle East Africa. So what we can extract from this piece of data, easier for Nike to improve margins by cutting expenses, aka firing employees. Number one. Number two, maybe we're seeing a rebound in demand in China. And that would be inflationary because China demand will revive commodities inflation. You put two and two together, stagflation crisis worsens because an American company gets rid of its employees, but then we see Chinese demand moving commodities pricing higher. Now we got another one this week from Lululemon. Shares plunge 16% in weaker guidance slowing North America growth. Notice the trend here, folks. China mainland for Lululemon, who's actually a huge increase year on year, 78% in net revenue, comparable sales up 56%. So China is coming back now. That's inflationary. The weakness is happening here domestically in the US consumer. Let's see what the problem with this company because the stock crashed by double digits on Friday. Net revenues up 15.6% year on year. Okay, that's good. What about the cost of goods sold? Up only 4.6%. That's pretty good because the rate of growth in net revenue exceeding the rate of growth in cost of goods sold. Here's the problem though. Expenses up 23.21% year on year. So now we have the rate of growth in expenses exceeding the rate of growth in revenue. The net income for now is positive by 26.85% if we include the one-time charge that happened last year. So you might look at this data and say, well, why is the stock upset, Maverick? Because net income is up 26.85% year on year. Sure, expenses are going higher, but what is the problem here? The problem, they're guiding the revenues down, but expenses will continue to move higher. So when you look at the rate of growth in revenues, 15.63% that we got this quarter, that's down from 1870 last quarter. You can see the trend heading down in the growth in revenue. They're actually guiding it lower in the next quarter. So Lulu Lamont will face the same problem. You cannot increase your selling price. You can try, but it might backfire. The easiest way to fix your margins is cutting your expenses, getting rid of employees. So in summary, folks, it is a really tough call because we see the pressure from inflation coming back up. And then we see pressure from these companies that need to reduce expenses and fire employees also going up. The question is, which one will show up first in the data? Higher unemployment or higher inflation? If it is higher inflation, the next move by the Fed will be a forced hike. If it is higher unemployment, then the next move by the Fed will be forced cut. The Fed will be forced into a decision, ladies and gentlemen, not by choice. And understanding which decision it's going to be is critical for you as an investor and as a participant in the economy. Because if it is a forced hike, of course, you're going to sell your assets in the stock market, probably short it, and then move your assets in interest rate bearing accounts, be it uh, in bonds, be it in otherwise. If the next move is a forced cut, then you know you're going to move your assets back into commodities, but specifically oil because we will see based on the inflation data, a receleration because of the cut, receleration in energy inflation. Again, long conversation, but it's really important to understand. Uh, we looked at the data in details. We're not speculating. We're not pulling opinions out of our asses. We're looking at the data, assessing where it's heading, and then reflecting those with opinions. But let me know what do you think in the comment section. Do you think the next move by the Fed will be a forced cut or a forced hike and why? But folks, I got to move on and cover the market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices on Friday and uh, here we go. The diamonds down in the red by 305.47 points or a decline of 0.77%. The NASDAQ positive in the green by 26.98 points or a gain of 0.16%. The spider down in the red by 7.35 points or a decline of 0.14%. While the Russell 2000 small caps got hammered on Friday. Down by 2.87 points or a loss of 1.38%. We'll look at these sectors on Friday. Com services at number one, the only noteworthy winner of the day. Thank you to Google, up by more than 2% for the session. But then every other sector was down, led by real estate, the yield sensitive. We contrast this with the weekly performance. It was positive across the board. Every sector closed positive, led by comp services, industrials, and technology. The assumption heading into next week that it's going to be the same. A positive week, but I told you where the catch is going to be. Friday's session. When we get the data dump, but you can't get out. 
if the data comes out ugly, you're locked in. So we need to make decisions before Friday. We'll look at the breadth on uh, last Friday's session, not upcoming Friday, last Friday. It was actually awful. In the NYSE, 25% advancing versus 74% declining. The NASDAQ, 32% advancing versus 65% declining. So the decline in the indices should have been worse because they usually play the cute game of, oh, the breadth is bad, but we can pump Google and then NVIDIA, Amazon a little bit, and then the market floats, and we muff the shot. We'll see how long this game is going to last, but here it is. Look at the heat map right away, folks. Ugly across the board, but then you got Google up 2%, you got NVIDIA up 3%. Those two are huge. They have a huge rating in the indices. So it tames the degree of the decline in the index. So a lot of you who are shorting the index, the SPY, the Qs, you need to see the big caps and chips going down together consistently for a few days before you have a successful short. Otherwise, the name of the game right now is to be tactical. And you only pick on weaker individual names until we see a catalyst that brings the big caps and the chips down together. As far as what you buy, we contrast the daily heat map with the weekly one. You can see that the majority of the market for the week did pretty good. What goes down goes down big, such as AMD, ACN, Nike. They go down in a big way. But you still have the big camps working, be it Google, be it Meta, Microsoft, Amazon. The exception, of course, Apple. Tesla's jittery. It's been an underperformer, but then it gets a big bounce. Who knows if that's sustainable or not. Then you have the chip mania. But even the chip mania, we're seeing cracks, such as AMD going down. So what do you go with here if you want to pick longs? We talked about energy. Every indicator says that energy is going higher. You see a lot of these energy names already at the highs, all-time highs again, with breakouts. You have the industrial sector still offering some good names. And with probably the comeback of China, that could be yet another positive catalyst that push industrials higher. You got metals. That could ride in the wave of China. Copper been doing pretty good as of late. Then you got the revival of activities in the housing market. That's going to be good for the home builders, but also good for the home improvement stores such as Home Depot and Lowe's. So you have a lot of things you can pick in the market here besides the mania in AI, be it big caps or chips. Some of the healthcare sector is still doing okay. We see some uh, corrections and now we see folks buying the dips in certain names like Amgen. The staples are beginning to heat up after the data that we got from GIS that now they're restoring the pricing power. So we see PepsiCo up about 4.5% for the week. Mondelez and Hershey's are about to pass the increase in cocoa prices down to us consumers. So we see these stocks getting rewarded for the week. A lot of places you can go long, a lot of places you can go short. But the indices right now, unless we see a collective decline in the big caps and the chips, it doesn't make a good short. We look at the heat map for the ETFs for the week. Bitcoin ETFs were down, but besides that, everything was up. Small caps, mid caps, value, large caps. I think now as we hit into next week, it's going to become more of macro dependency rather than following momentum or even following the Fed. And the most important piece of data is coming out Friday. It will make a really interesting session, folks. Will we see de-risking or would folks just continue to buy? And then comes Friday and they bag everybody. But looking at the map all in all, where is the weakness for the week? Real estate, that's rate sensitive. You got the XBI biotech, that's rate sensitive, profitless companies. You have the dollar going higher. So we see gold miners going down for the week about 1%. You see SLV silver down about 2% for the week. Dollar sensitive is also China, the FX size. So we see Chinese equities going down. But then because of the housing data, although being yield sensitive, the XHB home builders actually went higher by almost 5%. So the data matters. It's being reflected in the market, folks. Let's move on to commodities. On Friday, it was down across the board because we've seen stunning reversal in the dollar. Thursday, Friday, the dollar keeps going higher because the data, specifically that flash PMI, said watch out, dollar is going to go higher. So now we see a pullback in metals, gold, silver, platinum, copper, palladium, all down in the red. We see a pullback in grains. Grains and metals are the most sensitive to the dollar. And right now, the dollar is betting that the next move by the Fed will probably be or end up being at a hike. I think something is going to show up in the data, though, be it the unemployment rate or otherwise, that could force the conversation of a rate cut, then the dollar goes down, and we see that reinflation scenario back in, in metals and grains. Too early for that, but we just looked at the data and speculated based on the data. We we'll look at the action on Friday in softs, cocoa, no stop in sight, up over 3.5% for the session, orange juice, also up about 2%, that we see mild pullbacks in sugar, coffee, and cotton futures on Friday's session. Mild pullbacks across the energy sector, although gasoline, our Bob, was up by a little over than quarter percent, 
On Friday's session, NatGas remains the weaker link in energy commodities, but we heard the commentary by EQT CEO who warned that the lack of capacity, storage capacity specifically here in the US, will cause pricing to go higher in the future. Now, I don't know what future means near or long, but I know that we have a problem with the infrastructure. So in the meantime, oil services, the OIH, is a lot better of a play than natural gas. Then we look at the weekly performances all in all, we see the cocoa once again on top, with gains of more than 10.5% for the week. Then we see the comeback of wheat. Wheat is up about five and a quarter percent for the week. On the downside, though, we see palladium losing about 9%, platinum also losing about four and three quarters of a percent. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here on Friday? We got options expiration, so the volume moves higher, but I'm seeing less and less demand for calls as they get really, really expensive. I see folks beginning to shift into puts, be it in Nvidia, be it in Tesla, be it in Apple, or even AMD. We need to see more of that before we see some of these names beginning to crack. And of course, you need NVIDIA to go down. Apple is already getting hit. Tesla already getting hit. AMD already getting hit. But you need NVIDIA to get hit. And for now, the SKU is still about 60% calls versus 40% puts. Folks are not ready to switch yet. Even though you look at these calls, they're really, really expensive. But folks continue to speculate on them. We have to look at the chart and then speculate whether it's worthy to go with these calls or not for this upcoming week. We'll do that in a minute, but let's do the flows on Friday, bullish flows. We see them in NVIDIA again, in the E-mini futures, in Broadcom, MicroStrategy, Coinbase. But we see bearish flows in Pindudu, Lululemon, SPY, Tesla. I think that the action all in all was tame in the options market, given that we have a shorter expiration week this week. Even though it was OPEX, but again, I don't think folks want to speculate a lot in a short and trading week. Maybe comes Monday, we'll see more activities, but for now, it is noteworthy that folks are continuing to bet to the upside on NVIDIA. Let's look at the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. We begin with the Qs. And here we have a put options trade. The trader is betting that the queues will go down by more than five and a quarter percent by the expiration date of April 19th. So they bought the 423 puts. They paid about one buck and 42 cents apiece. Tenor, this trade, all in all, spending about one and a half million dollars. And then at the bottom of the table, we have the ticker BABA -B -A Alibaba. They're betting on more downside to come. Now, we talked about the Chinese consumer actually doing a lot better in Nike and Lululemon's earnings. But would the rise in the dollar hammer Chinese equities anyways? I think this is what the trader is betting on. They bought the 66 puts for the expiration date April 26 with expectations that the name will go down and lose more than 8.5% of its value by then. Paid about 55 cents a piece, tenor this trade, all in all spending about $300,000. But you can see that the activities are really weak. Uh, nobody's spending serious cash heading into a short and trading week. So let's do the charts and then wrap it up. We begin with the SPY, the S&P 500, a one minute chart because we've seen an interesting flush by the end. And now we have speculation that if we get a gap down, comes the open on Monday, would it be an island reversal? An island reversal meaning that you keep that gap higher with no connection. So we have a gap higher, then it ends with a gap down. And these are one of the strongest reversal signals. We look at the MACD, the momentum indicator. It suggests that we have more downside to come. We need to cool off a little bit. So my expectations are for a week opening on Monday, and then we take it from there. Maybe we close the gap, and then we find buyers. But well, you look at the daily chart, any damage here? Absolutely not. All what happened is we have a gap outside of the upper Bollinger Bands. That's a violation. You'll find sellers right away looking for a correction. And now that we've corrected, we're back within the Bollinger Bands. Maybe we need to cool off a little more before we find buyers speculating in a shortened trading week. When we look at the hourly chart for the E-mini futures, what do we see here? We talked about the importance of 5,218. We got two false breakouts, but then we've seen a higher low. And third time is a charm. Once that break happened, and we did not go down and lose 5,218. Instead, we got consolidation. Of course, you cannot really speculate what the Fed is going to do. But looking at the technicals alone, the setup was for the market to move higher. And indeed, after the FOMC, we see the big, huge move higher. Then we have consolidation, indecision. Nobody wants to pick it up right now. So we see a downward sloping channel. And the question now becomes, will it be a break to the upside of the channel or the downside? If it is a break to the downside, no harm done. 
until we lose 5,257.25. Even with that, folks, you really need to lose 5,218 before you see a sign of damage. On the weekly chart for the SPX, the cash index, what do we see here? It is a steep rising wedge, one of the longest uncorrected rallies in market history. We're witnessing history right now. And the thinking goes that once the correction happens, it will happen for a really bad reason, and we will see a nasty reaction to the downside where you shave off three, four, five weeks with one weekly candle to the downside. Now, I agree with this outlook, but for now, you look at the indicators, the MACD, the RSI, none of them really showing a signal that we are reversing at all. And the Bollinger Bands in the weekly chart is still expanding higher, so we have uh, 5,300. Maybe that could be a target to be achieved this week. And then we see a topping signal after that. Unless, of course, the break outside of the rising wedge pattern happens on weekly basis before that. So I'm looking for either a break of the rising wedge by the end of the week or reaching 5300, then showing a sign of topping. If we look at the cues and hourly chart, what do we see here again? The risk is if you look at the MACD indicator, we're seeing loss in momentum and that should continue. And it could continue in, let's say, an inverse ABC pattern. But if it happens Monday, right upon the open with, let's say, a gap down, it would be an island reversal. And that might bring in more sellers just because of the technical pattern alone. So we'll keep an eye on that. But for now, we also keep an eye on the gap. It could be going down to fill the gap below. Then we find support. So you have to keep an open mind. But for now, the bias says that we're heading for a continuation of a pullback. On the daily chart, do we see any damage here? Not really. We just have a peak outside of the upper Bollinger Bands. Usually we have a correction right away, pushing the index back within the Bollinger Bands as that happens. So besides that, we don't see any tangible damage on the daily chart. How about the weekly chart for the Qs? Again, the same rising wedge pattern. This is a little weaker than the SPY. Because you look at the MACD, it is closer for a reversion than the SPY. In other words, we look at the Qs, the NASDAQ, technology is a leading indicator for the rest of the market. If we begin to see the big caps showing signs of weakness, and we have some of them doing that, um, naming Apple, of course, but we need to see more. We need to see weakness in Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta, not to mention Google, of course. And then we need to see a weakness in chips. In the chip sector, I look at NVIDIA. That's the most important name. As NVIDIA goes, the rest of the chips will go. So we need to see a little more weakness in that sector. If it begins to show up, then it will be a leading indicator that the rest of the market will become weak too. If you look at the daily chart for the NASDAQ futures, weaker than the SPY. We see perhaps a double top. Confirmation, we lose the trend line. I would say in or around, let's say, 18,121 and a half. If we lose that, then we have a confirmation that trend is beginning to reverse. If you look at the IWM small caps and hourly chart, what do we see here? We got back to the highs, but we were met with failure. And a lot of folks were speculating this is a bull flag pattern on Thursday. Higher we go, we beat the highs. But I said, keep your eye on the MACD indicator on the hourly. That is showing topping and signs of reversal. So the next likely move will be the downside. And indeed, we got it. And we lost 205.49, forming a bear flag pattern that is playing out right now. And I don't see a sign in the MACD that says that we're done with the downside yet. Maybe we'll do that if we get down to 202.53, that we find support on the daily chart. All what we got is reaching the upper Bollinger Bands, forming a topping pattern, then a confirmation for a reversal. Now we're awaiting a close below the 20 days moving average again to say, okay, we formed a lower high, and that could be the catalyst for a lower low, aka an inverse ABC pattern. You look at the weekly chart for the IWM, anything to see here? Not really. If you look at the MACD, I think that the bullish momentum is peaking closer to being in a peak and will reverse, no doubt about it. The question now becomes when it reverses, not if, but when it reverses, will it be amicable, such as the IWM just consolidating in a range, and then bullish momentum is restored and higher we go? Or will it be in a sharp pullback? I think we have to look at the components of the IWM, such as the KRE uh, regional banks and the XBI biotech before we make that judgment. We'll do that in a minute. But before doing that, how about we look at the dollar, king dollar, that's what really matters. You can see that Jerome Powell on Wednesday gave us a reversal signal. So we lost the 20 days moving average. You see the red candle. And at the time I said, I got to go with it. That dollar is going down. I disagree, but that's what Powell wants. Why would I fight the Fed at this point? So I think the dollar goes down, gold goes higher. You know the deal. But then came that nasty piece of data from the flash PMI. One of the worst I've seen in, in many months, really. You see the reversal in the dollar. Message received. Bullish engulfing candle. And now we see a big shot up higher. I think the dollar is heading higher until we see something bad, a bad piece of data showing up. And I don't think it's going to happen this week.
So we look at the old man gold, what do we see here? It's been resilient, it's been holding ground, and it tried to move higher, but at some point, the old man has to succumb to the will of the dollar. If the dollar is heading higher, what do we see in the daily momentum in gold? Look at the MACD indicator. That's weakening, it's about to reverse into bearish. The RSI is trending down. The vortex indicator, the red line, that's the bearish momentum, is moving higher. The blue line, your bullish momentum, is moving down. So we know that gold is heading down. Will it find support in the 20 days moving average? That will be an amicable pullback and uh, whether it's going to get bought at that point or not, that remains to be seen. If we go down to 2080, for example, that will be a bad correction. That would be sort of a failure to launch higher. And then we have to rethink our outlook for gold. But for now, assuming it is just an amicable pullback, it is warranted, no harm done yet. You look at the GDX gold miners, we got a topping signal on Thursday, failing to close above 30.49. And then we got a confirmation for the topping signal on Friday, as we lost 29.77. You see the MACD is about to show negative momentum, the hour size and negative divergence. You see the look in the vortex indicator, red line rising, blue line declining. So you know what's going to happen here. We have more declines to come in gold miners. Say we go down to the 20 days moving average. Would that be tangible damage that reverses, say, the weekly outlook? For now, not really. Because you look at the weekly chart. This chart is still positive. Bull flag pattern. RSI firming up. MACD firming up. So absent of closing for the week, below the 20 weeks moving average at 29, I don't think that we're going to have tangible damage in the chart. So watch for a revisit to the 20 days moving average in the GDX. Then a rebound if you want to stay bullish in gold miners. The SLV, on the other hand, I don't like the SLV as much as I do gold and gold miners. I think the SLV silver is a higher beta and it will show more declines if we have the dollar going higher again. And that's inevitable. Because you look at the indicators, MACD, RSI, Vortex, it is just a matter of time before we lose 22.53 and we head down to the 20 days moving average, then we have to see how it holds at that point. We look at Brent Oil, UK Oil for the week. What do we see here? Maintaining 85 for support. That is really critical for the continuation of the bull flag break. So we have to zoom into the daily chart and see how it looks. If we maintain 85 for support, we begin to move higher as soon as Monday. It could be a breakout in an ABC pattern. So for now, oil remains bullish, absent of losing 85 on Brent, absent of losing the 20 days moving average. We look at the 10-year yield. What do we see here in bond yields? We see that in the 10-year, we lost the 20 moving average. And you see that the MACD is showing negative momentum on the daily. So granted, that could last for, let's say, a few days. What about the weekly, though? That's the main concern. We're above the 20 weeks moving average. That's bullish, not bearish. You look at the MACD. It's a battlefield right now. We want to watch the behavior on the daily chart. If it begins to recover, then no doubt about it, the weekly chart in the 10-year is heading higher. And that will be bad for equities, bad for Jerome Powell, because it will indicate that they have to hike rates, whether they like it or not. Look at the XHB Home Builders weekly chart. What do we see here? We got a breakout based on the data that we got, that existing home sales moving higher. But you have to understand that the XHB is mostly new home sales. That data is coming out Monday. If it comes out weaker than existing home sales, then I think the XHB will head down. And right now, it reached the upper weekly Bollinger Bands. I think that should be really strong resistance. So I'll be looking at the opportunity to go short the XHB, but that's only going to happen if we have a confirmation on weaker new home sales, not existing home sales. For now, the easiest short between the two is real estate, the IYR. Look at that daily chart. We have a rejection of the 20 days moving average in wide. We have negative momentum in the RSI, MACD, Vortex. Look at the weekly chart for the IYR. It appears that we have a lower high. It appears that the MACD on the weekly chart is changing into bearish. You see the Vortex already given us the signal. So we're just waiting a closing below the 20 weeks moving average. And then we'll see the IYR flushing down back to the lower Bollinger Bands in the weekly chart. So the IYR is the easiest short versus the XHB. What about the KRE regional banks? What do we see here on the hourly chart? We talked about the need to revisit 48.53. We did not get that on Thursday, but we got it on Friday. Now what? You can argue that we lost 48.53. We lost it by a tick. We're not going to make a federal case based on a few cents here. So how do we decide whether the KRE is going to rebound or move further down? We look at the weekly chart. What do we see here? A closing below the 20 weeks moving average. In other words, playing the bear flag pattern. I would say the stronger case right now for further declines in the KRE rather than a rebound. Now, if we look at the XBI biotech daily chart, what do we see here? We got a rejection of the 20 days moving average and we're heading down. That is a negative. And that'll be bad for the IWM small caps. Now, we look at the weekly chart for biotech. What do we see here? 
holding 92 95 for support if we lose that it appears that we're gonna lose it i think we have a revisit to the weekly 20 days moving average that will bring a pullback to the xbi biotech and a pullback in the iwm but then if it holds the 20 weeks moving average then we could see a rebound later on in the biotech sector what about the vix daily chart what do we see here we see a higher low we might have maxed out on the downside here in the vix because we got outside of the daily bullinger bands and now we're catching a rebound the consensus goes that we have a short and trading week so volatility should be tamed but again volatility pops when least expected I think this week I don't want to trade volatility but if we see a closing above let's say 13.48 by the end of the week better yet a closing above the 20 days moving average and whatever happens on Friday read the PCE and the commentary by Powell it could lead to more volatility in the week to come not this week but the week after how about we move to the formerly known as the big kahuna apple daily chart what do we see here flush down candle rejection of the 20 days moving average that's a no-go but he shorted here it didn't lose 170 folks and the momentum in the macd the rsi is still positive i don't want to short it right now i look at the hourly chart i see maybe the possibility of a bear flag pattern but why don't i wait till we lose 170 we close below 170 for the day and that would be the signal that down it goes we have further downside to go tesla souffle hourly chart what do we see here we gave it the benefit of the doubt that it could close above 175 it couldn't it tried twice and it couldn't it just gave us a failure candle on friday we lost 170.60 but then we closed above so for now indecisive you can't really make one move or the other in tesla if we close above 175 i'm gonna go with a longer side if we lose 163.91 the gap then i'll go with the short side if you look at the daily chart right now, it is even more confusing. So you look at the MACD, still positive, but it could turn negative again. If it turns negative, we have the lower Bollinger Bands at 155.37 as the target, the short. If it goes back to positive again, then we have the 20 days moving average as the target, and that would be 181. So we'll go with, let's say, 175, 180 call spread, or 180, 185. We'll talk about it once we see a break one way or the other. On the weekly chart, though, it remains bad looking. The last line of defense is 152.37, which is in or around the lower daily Bollinger Bands. If we lose that, there is no doubt in my mind. That we're heading down to the 110 line the previous low and when it rains it pours i mean we have some good news for the souffle the CERN models are now seeing price hikes that's good for the company of course not for the consumer but then we continue to get bad news the latest being tesla trimming the output of cars in china amid a slower ev sales growth and after the data that we got from nike and lululemon the question now becomes is it really weakness in the overall ev market in china or is it just weakness in tesla because they're losing market share to byd and other competitors that's an important question to answer because if it is the latter it's even more bad news for tesla then we got Senator Warren also calling for the SEC to investigate Tesla and Elon Musk. That also adds to the negativity for the name. If you look at NVIDIA hourly chart, what do we see here? We talked about the inverse in his shoulder. We talked about give it a little chance to crack above 924 and give us the confirmation. It did that on Friday. But 950 was the highest number of open interest for calls. The market maker, of course, doesn't want to pay these guys the 950 calls. So they managed to close below 950 by the end of the week. Now, where do we go? The bias remains to the upside in NVIDIA. Because when you look at the daily chart, look at the MACD indicator. It went into negative. Usually we see pullbacks, flush downs, corrections. But when the negative momentum plays out in consolidation, that's actually a bullish signal. It says that the stack is not ready to go down. And the moment we see the bearish momentum is over, we see a resurgence and a move higher in the stack, sometimes impulsively so. So right now, I would say that the former highs are on the books for this week. We could go back to the highs again at around 975-ish. I would only pick on NVIDIA if we lose the 20 days moving average. That would be a signal to go short. But for now, the risk remains to the upside. And if it plays out this way, the trade could be for this week. The 975 calls, a butterfly spread. Then we sell 2 to 1, the 1,000 calls, and we buy the 1025 as a hedge. The implications are that NVIDIA goes to 975 and above, but not above 1,000 by the end of the week. It goes above then the trade goes kaput the problem is if you buy a debit spread it will cost you over 500 bucks for a short and trading week i don't want to spend that much this trade will cost you about two bucks and 20 cents a piece if nvidia opens positive no signal to worry on monday that this could be a trade that's worth exploring because if we close short of 1000 by the end of the week it could pay 
north of 700% worth of gains. So it is worth exploring, but you need to see how we're going to open on Monday. Then let's do cryptos, Coinbase daily chart, speculation for a double top. That could be the case. Confirmation losing the 20 days moving average. And of course, we have the momentum indicators, MACD, Vortex, RSI, all showing signs of weakness here. So we do have a case for a double top. But hold your horses because MicroStrategy also showing signs of weakness. That maybe we have an inverse ABC pattern, confirmation losing the 20 days moving average. And the indicators are showing signs of a reversal from bullish to bearish. MACD, RSI, Vortex. Now you look at Mara, the uh, miner, it got to the 20 days moving average. It appears that we have a rejection. Maybe we head down, but the confirmation will be losing 1988. We lose that. We have further downside to go. We'll short it all the way to the lower Bollinger Bands at around 15. But before we do any of these decisions, we have to look at the mother chart, Tulips, Bitcoin, daily chart. What do we see here? It appears that maybe Bitcoin wants to find a footing and go above the 20 days moving average again. So we'll give it the benefit of the doubt. I would say if we have a failure to cross above the 20 days moving average, then we can play these negative looks on the proxies, Coinbase, MicroStrategy, and Mara. So we have to look at the hourly chart. What do we see here in Bitcoin? 64, 100 is my support. If we lose that, I got a problem. I have to short the proxies. But for now, we have a sloping trend line of resistance that has been broken, retested as support, and so far, so good. Confirmation going above 67,000. So if we have a failure at 67,000, then we head down to 64,100 and we lose that, I'll be shorting the proxies. Otherwise, I'll be holding on that decision. All right, let's move on to the conclusion of this video, folks. What do we have in the economic calendar this week? Reminder, shortened trading week. No Friday, but Monday tomorrow. We have a bunch of Fed zombies from Atlanta, Rafael Bostic, and from Chicago, Austin Goolsby. But the most important piece of data would be new home sales. That's going to be really important for Lennar, D.R. Horton, Toll Brothers. So keep an eye on that piece of data. Tuesday the 26th, we have Durable Goods, and we have the Case Chiller Home Index, along with Consumer Confidence. Wednesday the 27th, we have Governor Waller speaking, and then Thursday the 28th, an important day. We have initial jobless claims, we have the second revision for the GDP. Then we have the Chicago Business Barometer, comes on top of pending home sales. That's really important for the housing data. And then followed by the final reading and consumer sentiment. And then we wrap it up, but the week is not over yet, because Friday the 29th, we get a slew of data, perhaps the most important pieces of data. We begin with advanced uh, U.S. trade balancing goods and retail inventories, wholesale inventories. Then comes personal income, personal spending. That comes as a part of the most important PCE inflation rate. And if you thought, we're just going to wrap it up right here. Then we got Fed Chairman Zombie Powell coming out again. All of this is going to happen while the market is closed. So it could be a nasty bagging operation here, folks. We're going to cover it day by day. If you enjoyed the show, folks, and you found it informative, please press the like button, subscribe, leave us a nice comment in the section, participate in the conversation, and consider being a member. You can join us here on YouTube and access the daily videos and many more. But if you don't want to pay the big man, you can look at the description of this video and find a link in Patreon, where we'll also produce videos on a daily basis. With that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Holy f***ing shit.